All right, all right, welcome back to the homestead. We're gonna get right into it. Dr. Leo's here and we have to do our inspection. We, uh, we uh, opened them up after winter. We looked around what was going on and uh, we took the hive, the horizontal hive here that we had and we switched it into the Lanes. Lanes horizontal hive. That's right, from the Langstroff horizontal hive. And all these uh, plans and all these hives we're talking about are at horizontalhive.com. Uh, Dr. Leo's back. And so we did that first inspection, and now what we're going to be doing is seeing how the brood's looking, um, make sure they got enough frames to build on there, and that they're not getting crowded and stuff, right? That's correct. And you know, I'm right this moment getting emails from uh, your viewers, and some are already catching swarms in the boxes that set out on the trees, and others are asking questions, okay, I'm not into climbing the trees, can yeah. I just buy a package of these because it's more convenient? So you now at the beginning of this video I really felt it was urgent to get that point across that of course you can start beekeeping in any way but you need to realize that the commercial bees that you buy in package form are the semi-domesticated uh, kind that completely depend on you for their survival. Right. You need to feed them, you need to treat them against the parasites, etc. So please realize that what we are doing here with Doug is only possible if you are working with this disease resistant low constraint of bees. Yeah, that's true. A lot of people are asking those questions. Why, we, why don't we tackle the mite problems when they see us open up to some of these hives and we let nature take its course. The bees will work with the hive beetles and other things in there and clean them out, get them in and the strong hives will survive. I mean, that's just the way it is in nature. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's so we're going to open this up right here. We're going to see what's going on. We're going to kind of walk you guys through these steps. And if the hive is strong enough right now, it's possible we could even split that, take a queen, a new queen that's being formed, and then put her into another hive over there. And that's another way you guys can, uh, with your beekeeping, make money for your homestead. You could take a hive. I think last year when we started opening these up, uh, we were getting four or five queens maybe getting going. Well, I could have split seven, eight times last year, I think he said. So. You know, there's, you just got to pay attention to everything and keep visiting them a little bit and kind of watch their patterns. So. And one thing we can notice right off the bat is the hive is really active. They're really doing good. They took the transfer very well. We've had some cooler days. We even had snow, if you guys remember. And uh, today's probably one of the hotter days. Um, and we've had probably one or two other hot days since the last visit with Dr. Leo. He's getting a smoker ready here. And uh, so they're really doing pretty good, I think. So we're going to see if they're going to need a few frames and whatnot. So. And I still got these broken ribs, so I'm going to be moving a little funny here. You got her? Oh my. Oh my, they are. You know, when I Doug told me that he had an injury and he was not able to go into this hive and add more frames, I was concerned that the bees might run out of room. And I'm glad that we are doing this here today before they started building their honeycomb in the empty section. Yeah, that's what you were worried about, yeah? Yeah, but this amount of activity is wonderful, you know. If everything goes well, we'll look at how much brood they have there. And because Doug wants to increase the number of hives, if we have at least six full frames of brood, we might be able to make two colonies out of one. That's called artificial swarming in the old books, or it's called their split uh, today. So this divider board helps to decrease the volume of the hive very early in the spring when the nights are still colder and the colony is still smaller. And there you need to move it side aside and add more frames before they run out of room. And yeah, look at that, they are running out of room. You see honey and nectar on the top, you see drone brood. Here. So all of these cells that are capped with their um, cappings that look like sandpaper and that are sticking out and bulging out like bullets, these are male uh, cells with drones inside. So when the colony is starting to invest energy in reproduction and raising a lot of drones, that means first they have the resources and the strength to do it, and second they uh, may start preparations for swarming too. Right. 
So uh, when I open the hive, I have a crayon with me and I'm writing on the tall bar what I'm seeing. This way after the inspection I can take a look and uh, see exactly how many frames of brood, honey reserves, drone brood, uh, any queen cells that I'm seeing. So on this one I write D for drones. The last frame is a frame with drone brood and it's very very heavy. And uh, the next one also has brood and honey and uh, drone brood on it. So I put B for brood. And we keep moving. More brood, more drone brood. Wow, very strong colony. You know, when I see that much brood during an inspection, I started paying more attention to whether we might have some queen cells. These are bigger cells that look like peanuts. Uh, and this would mean that the colonies are on the brink of swarming. They are raising a new queen and uh, once she is ready to hatch, the mother queen will leave the hive with half of the bees to found a new colony. So two full frames of brood and lots of drone brood. Uh, I see some drone comb that goes across several frames and we'll have to correct that. So I'll just take this drone brood for now and put it aside. We're able to put it into one of the frames uh, and secure it there so it's not wasted. But uh, it's really preferable to have all frames uh, straight without any pieces of comb that uh, connect several frames together. This way how you can manage the hive uh, quicker and with uh, less disturbance. Okay, this frame is brood again. And brood is eggs, small larva and the cells that look like uh, sandpaper covering where the la larva are being transformed into adult bees like this. Another thing you want to pay attention to during a spring inspection, this is May 1st, is whether they have sufficient reserves. This is honey and nectar. Once they start rearing a large amount of brood during warm weather, they go through honey and nectar and pollen very quickly. And if the weather becomes rainy or cool, they may run off the reserves uh, very quickly. So just because winter is over, do not assume your bees cannot starve. They might. So if you are planning on splitting them first, you need to make sure there are enough bees, uh, there is enough brood, and that they have sufficient reserves to sustain either the expansion of the nest or and the artificial swarm or split. Another beautiful frame of uh, brood. Usually when visiting a hive I don't really try to find the queen because the presence of plentiful brood is evidence enough that there is a queen and the queen is in good health. But uh, uh, if I find a, the queen today we will just put her in a separate box and this one left without the queen will raise themselves a new queen. So we will accomplish what bees will want to accomplish through swarming only without losing the swarm and without letting them leave their box. But will accomplish the same as they would accomplish in nature, creating two colonies instead of one. The prospect of finding a queen in a colony with maybe 30 or 40 thousand bees in it may sound unrealistic, but the thing is that she is only likely to be on certain frames. 
if the frames are full of honey and cat brood she is not very likely to be there she will be found usually on the frame when there are empty cells and the ones with freshly laid eggs because this is where the queen would be roaming and depositing eggs into whatever cells are available for her Here's the queen. Big and beautiful. This time of year finding a queen may be a little bit more complicated because there are so many big drones around. But with some practice you will be able to distinguish her. So we found the queen and we are putting the queen in this box and we will uh, take it into the woods. Uh, to the other decorated hive. Handle the frame with the queen carefully and cover it so the bees do not escape. Um, this time of the day, uh, it's around two o'clock, it's very good to make these operations because the forager bees are outside the hive on the flowers, which may, it makes it easy to find the queen and it also makes it easy to estimate how many bees are really the house bees. If we were to take many of the frames here at the end of the day or early in the morning and move them to another hive just a few hundred feet away, what will happen is that at noon, during the warm part of the day, the foragers will leave the box even if you moved it, uh, but they will be coming to the original location. Now, when I'm taking frames with uh, uh, bees and uh, brood, and the bees that are on the frames are the ones that are not foraging yet so they will not desert the new hive that you put them in they will stay put there and eventually the brood will hatch and the population will recover and the whole hive will uh, get repopulated and the queen will be there so you will really have two instead of one I'm so confident we can uh, split this colony today without our uh, uh, damaging them or compromising their vitality because uh, for a successful artificial swarm you want to have at least three full frames of brood for each part the one that's left behind and the one that you are splitting and now I'm not even through the entire box and I already see seven good frames of brood if we did nothing the colony would uh, become more and more and more congested as all of these cells are being emptied of the bees, new generations are being born and then at some point they will be so crammed there that half of the bees and the old queen will leave um, to found a new colony. So in a sense what we are doing today is a kind of midwifery. You are assisting to the birth of a new colony. And I very much think that it is still part of natural beekeeping because we are still doing what bees are trying to accomplish on themselves. They want to have more than one colony, they want to be fruitful and multiply and they'll achieve this even quicker and more securely with our help. Uh, when you do the uh, split, if you found the queen like we did and put it, her in a box, you need to be absolutely sure that you are leaving some eggs behind uh, in the hive that will have no queen. The bees will need three things to raise a new queen. They will need resources and they have plentiful honey and nectar and pollen here. They will need plenty of bees to nourish the brood and nourish the new queen uh, while in the cell. And they also will need to have enough bees to heat all of that. Uh, so they also need an egg to raise the queen from. So here I see there is a very nice uh, frame with eggs. You can barely see them at the bottom of the cells. And I am not just mutilating the cells for no purpose. When you break the bottom section of the cells containing eggs or tiny larvae in this manner, it makes it easier for the bees to transform these cells from worker into queen production mode. So on this one I write E for eggs and I know that this frame needs to stay behind because this is what will give rise to the new queen in this colony. And this happens very quickly. Uh, two weeks from now they will have a new queen hatched, uh, give her a little bit more time to get fertilized. They're going on a 
mating flight with drones and then one month from today Doug will make an inspection and he will see new brood and new eggs from the newly raised queen and uh, this brings across the importance of working only with local bees one more time because if Doug was surrounded by other beekeepers who brought their bees from the south from completely different climate and also bees that have very low level of uh, disease resistant then his newly raised queen would mate with non-local drones and her adaptation will be compromised and all her progeny won't be as healthy and vital as uh, the previous generation was. Do you have any other beekeepers within the mile of you that you are aware of, Doug? We are it. Okay, lucky you. <laughs> Alright, more eggs. And more brood. And more brood on this last one. Alright, so we have uh, basically 10 frames of brood and lots of reserves and eggs and everything. The colony is really, really, really strong. We'll have two instead of one in 20 minutes time. Okay, so now what I do, I take frames, they have a lot of brood and lots and lots of bees, but preferably not too much drone brood because it will be more difficult for a small colony to support a lot of drone population. So make sure that the frames you are taking uh, have lots of uh, capped worker brood, the ones with the cappings that do not uh, uh, stick out like bullets, so this one. So let me take this in this frame and we have the queen there and we have uh, one frame of these and this is number two and this is number three and I'll take one more and this is really plenty. And I also realize that the colony that you are creating will have few if any foragers so uh, make sure that you are giving frames that are heavy with honey so that while new foragers are being uh, produced within this new colony they have reserves to get by so I'll take this frame it's really really heavy For this colony, because they will keep her bringing pollen and nectar from the field, but now that uh, they won't have brood to feed until the new queen starts producing three to four weeks from today, um, that means they will still have a lot of nectar coming in and we need to give them some extra frames to deposit this nectar in. So we are putting this in there actually one and with this level of activity Doug can also confidently add their three or four frames with foundation right now and there uh, remember we had this piece of drone brood home that was built regularly so we'll just embed it into one of these frames so it's not wasted you press it into the wires and of course you will sacrifice whatever cells are against the wires on the other side but this way it will be embedded in the frame which will make management more convenient and the bees will keep building more calm around that so that next time you come it will all be incorporated into a bigger frame. If you have uh, rubber bands it may be helpful to secure it with rubber bands. Another technique described in keeping bees in horizontal hives by lay ends is to run a couple of strings of uh, stainless steel wire like this. Uh, whatever you can, even just a very thin thread, 
to help her hold it in place will work. But just even pressing this comb so that the wire goes into the middle of the comb and holds it while the bees will be busy repairing it and uh, reconnecting it with the frame uh, will be better than doing nothing and leaving it at the bottom of the hive. Okay. Also, if you have construction like that, the bees were running out of room and they start building on the divider board, it's really desirable that during this hive visit to trim off this uh, comb. You can do it especially if there is no uh, brood in there, just nectar. So you take it off if they start doing it, it is indication that you are late with giving them more frames. So let's trim this off and replace this. This is optional at this time of the year already because it's May and the weather will be nice and warm. But I like mi minimizing the volume of the nest for the colony that sustained the split. Uh, because the population will be reduced once there is no queen to lay more brood and produce new generation of the bees. And here how they're starting to buzz, that's one indication that they feel the queen is no longer with them. They determine whether the queen is there or not by her smell and when they're being disturbed like that and all of a sudden the smell of the queen starts going away, uh, very often you will hear the bees producing this high-pitched buzz. Where is our mommy? But I promise girls we wouldn't be doing it if we were not confident you can get a very good nice queen uh, to replace the one that we are taking uh, 200 feet away. Alright, that's it for this hive today. I always put a stone on two on top uh, to make sure that a uh, gust of wind doesn't uh, topple the hive and doesn't expose the frames to the rain. Rock on! E delivery! Uh, to complete the transfer, all we need is to transfer the frames from that. Uh, temporary box into this hive and this is the one that uh, didn't survive the winter because if you remember in previous episode there was a mouse that got into here early in the spring and the bees might have absconded so you scrape the bottom and make it clean for the new colony to move in There is no reason to try to make it like squeaky clean, removing every single bit of it. The bees will uh, clean up what you have not. One other reason to remove uh, this waste from the bottom of the hive is that part of it is composed of wax, small pieces of wax that fell on the floor. And if you were to leave it like that here, then uh, small hive beetles that thrive on uh, small bits of pollen and cocoons and any brood they can find inside the hive will uh, create an infestation into this layer of bits of wax at the bottom of the hive. 
The only reason really we're cleaning this out ourselves is because the colony did not make it through the winter. Uh, if the colony was uh, strong, it would have taken care of all the cleaning duties themselves. The previous hive we visited today doesn't require any cleaning at the bottom because the bees are there and they have special undertaker bees that are doing pretty much what I'm doing now. Another reason why you do not need it squeaky clean is that some of these impurities are bits of propolis. This is the antibacterial resin that bees collect on trees and other things in nature. And the presence of propolis helps them sanitize the nest and keep it free of disease and also uh, gives the new colony that we're installing here a nice smell that's welcoming them and telling them you have a new nest that's been previously occupied by bees, you are at home. So we open one entrance and we just take the frames and we put them straight in here in the same order they were taken from the previous hive with all the bees and everything in there. And I try to take two frames at, uh, at a time, this way we minimize disturbance. Another alternative for you would have been to take these frames and put them into the new hive that is on a garden cart and just roll it from our there in the pasture to here on a garden cart, then it would save you this uh, additional transfer of the frames into the box and then from that box into the permanent hive. At the same time though it's going to be a bumpy ride. It would be, I agree. So I'm taking a look to see whether the queen might be on the wall. If I find her I will grab her and put them her in here. If I'm not finding her, I will just shake all of the bees into this box and this will complete the transfer. Okay. The reason bees are not really starting to fly agitatedly is again when we take these frames in the middle of the day most of the foragers are away from home on flowers collecting nectar. So the bees that are on frames now are the young bees that do not fly yet outside the nest. This is why they behave very calmly, they stay put on the frame making this kind of transfer and what's called artificial swarm or split very easy. There is more detail on this procedure in Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives book and also Keeping Bees with a Smile 2020 edition. If you guys will notice a big difference when you're working your bees when everybody's out foraging then if you try to get in there early in the morning or late in the afternoon when everyone's returning from home or just leaving it's a lot more copacetic to work with your bees then so don't forget now I got four broken ribs here uh, so Dr. Leo is going to go on with this uh, talk here but we want to talk about the difference I guess between the honey that we're producing here on our local farm versus something you might purchase at a grocery store maybe. Correct, right? and even at the farmer's market. Even at farmer's markets. Because it's no guarantee that the honey you are getting is really, really good as you will see during the next 20 minutes. Wow, and then on top of that, we're gonna show you guys an extra way that you can use or a new way you can use or just another way you can use to extract the honey from the frames and it's called a press. So we're gonna break this down real quick for you guys. We're gonna take something under the microscope, it's pretty cool, and we're gonna break this down so you guys know the real honey versus the fake honey, right? Yeah. So to speak. So to speak. Or let's say conventional honey. Yeah. Conventional. Um, you saw how in the bee yard we were giving to the bees the frames with the empty wax honeycomb with no honey in it. This is the comb that we expelled honey from using the 
honey extractor. You can look up one of uh, Doug's previous videos when we were spinning out these frames. The honey comes out and the wax is intact and you can give it back to the bees. So not only you get honey harvest very quickly, but also you have all of these frames to give to the hives when you are increasing their volume and then making two out of one. So it's very, very valuable to uh, remove honey from the comb without breaking the wax. However, the most ancient way of harvesting honey is pressing it and squeezing out honey from wax comb and uh, today this is most efficiently accomplished with a stainless steel honey press like this one. I first saw it in Europe and I was thinking why do they do it because they're destroying the wax comb that they could give back to the bees but after tasting the honey that was produced on a honey press like that and comparing it to the extracted honey I just realized why people do it today even though it's more labor-intensive. So if you have any kind of honeycomb that you don't really need to give back to the bees because it's very old or because it's irregularly built or for example Doug is converting from Langstroth hives to Langs hive which is a different frame format so he has a bunch of frames that are the old style or let's say the conventional style and uh, he is not going to use them again with his bees so there is really no point in extracting it because he is not uh, giving it back to the hives. So what you can do instead, you can press this honey in a honey press like this. So the big difference is that when you spin a frame like that in a centrifuge called honey extractor, then the honey in the cells uh, will come out after you scrape them open. However, each frame will also contain what's called bee bread. This is pollen uh, fermented by the bees and they're used for feeding their larva and the queen and queen cells and producing royal jelly. And it's also super valuable human nutrition again. Bee bread, fermented pollen. So this bee bread that you will see in a second is so thick, it's not really flying out of the comb when you spin it. But when you press it in a honey press, both the nectar and the bee bread and everything else that you have in the frame like that is being squeezed out. So you obtain honey that has the maximum level of nutritional value. And I would say flavor too. If you have a frame that has beeswax foundation or no foundation at all, you can cut everything out with a knife and put it in a pot and mash it with a potato masher. If you have plastic foundation like on this frame, then uh, you just scrape it off with a spoon and put it in a stainless steel pot. One trick for doing it quickly is to do it in a very warm room, uh, 80 to 90 degrees preferably. Then honey is flowing easily and wax is very malleable and soft. So everything goes very quickly. Now look at this powder, the orange stuff here and the speckles there. This is the pollen that I was mentioning. Look out here. So now all of this pollen has been scraped off and will end up in the jar that we'll be pressing. So the pollen count of this honey that's squeezed rather than extracted is through the roof. There's simply no comparison. When I was a little child, this is the kind of honey I love the most, the one that has lots and lots of this bee bread. And it's called bee bread for a reason. It's really satisfying to eat like bread. It's very, very dense, uh, very nutrient rich to the point that some people cannot even eat bee bread because they get uh, allergies like from uh, vitamin overdose. I can eat a lot of bee bread, no problem. Yeah, as you're scraping down the comb, see all of these bits of orangish or yellowish paste? There is more here. This is bee bread. Uh, the bees pack it into the cells. Here is more and more. Oh, it's a mine of bee bread. Look at all of that. 
this is the most valuable nutritionally speaking part of honeycomb and we are capturing all of it by putting it uh, into the honey press rather than trying to extract it so bees collected from uh, flowers obviously look there is more some frames will have more bee bread than honey on them uh, and then they mix it with nectar and they ferment it using the same process as uh, we use for making sauerkraut or yogurt. Even the bacteria involved in making bee bread uh, are the lactobacteria we have in yogurt. And once it's fermented, it becomes a probiotic too. If you are looking for honey that would have uh, a high pollen count, then the pressed honey will be your honey of choice but beware you cannot just get that kind of uh, bee bread from uh, any kind of hive um, most of the bee bread is being deposited inside the brood chamber where the bees rear their brood and in conventional beekeeping this is the part of the hive that is being repeatedly treated with chemicals so if the frame like this one was coming from a commercial hive treated with chemicals then the bee bread would have very high toxic levels of uh, chemicals I wouldn't recommend using it for human nutrition even bees suffer and may die from uh, pesticide exposure when too much of it is being accumulated in the bee bread you know I've never used uh, plastic comb in my hives but ironically today uh, plastic comb is not the worst of the options because the beeswax foundation commonly available on the market um, has such a high level of pesticide residue in it. So if you have plastic comb at least it will not be transferring all of these uh, chemical pollutants to, into your hives. This frame has no plastic foundation and uh, you just take a knife and you slice it all and put it into that pot. Try not to run your uh, knife over the wires because it would dull it. When you keep bees naturally, like dog does, uh, no sugar feeding, no uh, treating against parasites, no chemicals in the hives, then uh, this uh, honeycomb from the brood section can be uh, used for human food. Unfortunately, if you have any commercial agriculture within two miles of your beehives, the bees will still bring some of the pesticide residue. Uh, but you know, today they find DDT in Antarctica and the whole world is no longer what it used to be. At least if you are not putting chemicals yourself into the hive, of course the concentration will be not as high as with conventional beekeeping that repeatedly treats the brood chamber, uh, sometimes up to three or four times a year. All right. Hey, that's why a lot of uh, regular Vertical hive beekeepers never get into the bee bread is because Correct. they're always working on the supers up above and there's never any a chance. And we're always, like you say, treating the bottoms or never really minding the bottoms that much because we're always after the, the supers up top with the honey. And also, you know, this comb looks dirty. It's yeah, black right. and unappealing. Uh, but it's ironic how the things that don't look perfect and white are actually the most nutritious. <laughs> look at the whole wheat flour right. or white bleach flour. Right. You know, in the old days, people were eating healthy whole foods. If it was grain, it was all crushed and milled together right. and ground together, capturing all of the 
uh, nutritional value. When people started separating things to make them look nice, right. we have now picture perfect apples, apples. and I was going there first, you know, yeah. white sugar and other uh, unnaturally clean looking products right. that are devoid of the nutrition. That's right. So this brown calm is where most of the nutrition is. If uh, uh, any predator, like a bear, breaks into the hive, they will that's go cool. after the that's dark right. one first. That's right. And unfortunately, there is no way uh, you can taste it other than maybe getting a jar of honey from Doug. And stay, stay tuned. tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> All right, but uh, it is very, very different from conventional honey. All right. So after you've uh, cut the comb, put it in the uh, stainless steel pot. And it doesn't have to be stainless steel, it can also be animal, but uh, stainless steel is so much better. Um, under no circumstances use uh, uh, aluminum utensils when processing honey because it can react with honey and will leach into honey. So the aluminum concentration there will be very high. And then you squeeze it down with a potato masher until it's this one big mass of uh, wax and honey. Then you are ready to press it. Uh, the honey press I use is uh, stainless steel throughout. Uh, do not use any presses that have a paint on them because this develops so much force that this paint will start flaking and peeling and getting in your honey. So the only maintenance really needed is to put one drop of any oil uh, in there to grease the bolt and just wind it up. This is made in Italy and I've used several uh, honey presses and this is the one I like the most. It's uh, also available from horizontalhive.com if you would like experience the pleasure of pressing your own honey and getting the most out of your honey and bee bread that the bees collect. Okay, so it tilts backward and then you are ready to start loading this basket with the honey that you squeezed or that you cut. Uh, you can go two ways about pressing it. One is just loading everything into this uh, um, barrel. The other one is to put a cheesecloth uh, or nylon sack there. Uh, I prefer putting no filter there. This way most of the bee bread being squeezed out is not uh, caught up by the filter. And also if you were to use a nylon bag after you compressed everything and there is just wax left, it would create such a thick and solid pancake at the bottom of the cylinder that it will be difficult to take out. Hey, shut up! Jiminy Christmas! See how it's coming out already? You put it back. And then you just wind it down. Of course this press can also be used for pressing grapes or uh, apples for making cider or your own juice. And I like uh, bolting it to a piece of plywood and clamping the plywood uh, to your tabletop. This way you don't need to drill into the tabletop, but it is very stable. Now look at that. If you, put, if you look closely at what's coming out, you notice that in addition to the honey being squeezed out, there are small bits of wax and also small bits of orangey paste being squeezed out. This is bee bread. And even the honey itself that's now flowing into the jar. Look how thick it is and how many quote-unquote impurities it has. At honey shows they judge honey by the purity. They look at it through, uh, you know, at light and any small bits of uh, 
be better than it would actually disqualify it. But that's what makes honey whole food, is the presence of high amounts of bee bread pollen in it. I need to go wrap another jar. You already feed him? No, there was no barbecue. Yeah, there is. There's signs up and everything. No, they sold out. Oh. <laughs> and I prefer not to filter this honey when it comes off uh, the press. I put it straight into the jar. If a small bit of wax gets in there, it will eventually float to the top. And if you don't care for it, you can scoop it up and uh, give it back to the bees. But I, I like the jars that have a little bit of beeswax and bee bread floating on the top. That's very special, like cream on top of yogurt. even looks like it's fermented. It's very frothy. Nice. Okay, and they say seeing is believing. Of course, the flavor of the honey and its nutritional value is something you'll be able to feel yourself when you compare the pressed honey to the extracted one. Uh, but I wanted to show you just how much pollen gets into the honey that's produced on a honey press instead of just being spun in a centrifuge and filtered and sometimes even micro filtered before it ends up on the supermarket shelf. So I borrowed my daughter's microscope and she was horrified. She said, Daddy, you will have honey all over my microscope. I won't be able to use it anymore. I promised I will be very careful. Uh, so you take slides and you take a drop of honey, just a very small amount, and you spread it here, and then squeeze it out, squeeze all the air out and just press it between two slides, and then it's ready to go into the microscope and we'll see what we see. So this is the kind of very simple analysis of uh, pollen count in honey that you can pay a special uh, firm to do for you. But also if you have access to a microscope, it doesn't have to be something very fancy. Um, just a basic microscope uh, with 100 magnification will be enough for you to see how much pollen you have in your sample of honey. So what I'm seeing here, and we'll try to capture it on the camera too, is when you look down, you'll see dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, specks of pollen in a tiny drop of honey that we've just pressed from Doug's honeycomb. Okay, you've seen that there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, specks of pollen in there. And for comparison, I bought some uh, organic honey uh, that uh, I, I just picked up from a supermarket. 
and uh, let's look at uh, how much pollen this organic honey from Brazil has. Same thing, you take one little drop, spread it on the slide, and press another piece of glass on top of this one. And then it's ready to go under the scope. And what I'm seeing now is that there is almost no pollen there. There are a few granules here and there, this big as an air bubble. But see where there were lots and lots of these grains in ducks honey, you do not see a single grain of pollen here. If you shift your field of view back and forth, you may find one. The small black ones are impurities like dust, it's not pollen. Oh, here is some pollen. But see there, no, this is, no, these are air, air bubbles, this is not even pollen. You know, when you examine a drop like that long enough, you will find some. Here it is. So now in the center of the slide, there is one speck of pollen. But compared to what you see in Doug's uh, sample, this is of course maybe 100 times less. And now for comparison, I wanted to show you my bee bread honey. So here we used everything that was in the frame. Honey and bee bread, everything mixed together. And already in every single drop, there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, grains of pollen captured. But at home, if I see a frame that has a lot of pollen in it, I actually will press this frame separately to maximize the amount of bee bread that is squeezed out in a jar. And then I uh, bottle it separately and then it's even thicker than the one we produced uh, from uh, ducks frames because this would be maybe 20% by weight bee bread. So when you take a drop of this uh, bee bread honey where you pre-selected the frames for the maximal pollen um, count uh, before even pressing it then uh, we we'll So when you press honey from the frames that were pre-selected for the maximum amount of bee bread they have, then the result is such that you see a carpet of uh, specks of pollen all over the slide. Look at that. Next time Doug does honey harvest, I will encourage him to segregate the frames with lots of bee bread and take these frames and press them separately from other frames con containing a lot of honey. This is how you can obtain honey that looks like this. See this carpet of uh, honey, these grains that look like uh, millet spilled over there. This is all pollen, 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 pollen. The bigger ones are um, bubbles of air. But all of that sand is uh, pollen granules. Again, compared to the commercial honey you got from the store, you would be scrolling the slide like that, and you might see one or two specks, but here you have hundreds and thousands in uh, one tiniest drop of honey pressed from bee bread frames. This is why, ironically, you know, this is the most expensive quote-unquote honey that I produce, but this is the one that is actually least expensive if you look at the nutritional value and not at the price per pound or per ounce. And this is the one that I call bee bread honey, and this is the one I sell out of first because people are looking for the maximum nutritional value in their honey and the highest pollen count understand that uh, a small jar like that, as you've seen on this slide, will have actually more pollen in it than maybe a 55-gallon drum of conventional honey from a supermarket. Sounds crazy. Man, where do you guys get 
any of this great bee information other than Off Grid with Doug and Stacy <laughs> with Dr. Leo here on YouTube and Facebook. I mean, you guys probably never even heard of this stuff before. This is stuff regular beekeepers just aren't telling you. So in this video, we stole the queen out of our active hive. We put her in an all new hive. They're gonna hatch out a new queen cell and create a new queen over there so there's no swarming. So you guys can stop swarming and actually just make it real easy and transfer. That's the other thing. If you guys uh, are doing the swarms and catching your swarms, that's cool. But to remember, if you catch it, you have to plant it right where you catch it or you have to remove it to an area and then bring it back after some time. With the artificial swarms that we just did, we were able to just grab the queen, take everything over to the new hive, and that made it super duper convenient. So. And also it's safer for the bees. Wow. The survival rate is only 25%. Mm. So by making the artificial swarm, you're actually helping bees propagate with much lesser risk than what they would have through the natural process. It's good stuff, man. I hope you guys are really liking this stuff, hitting that like on the way out. You know, you like these videos, like this information. And let me know in the comment section, have you ever even heard of bee bread or this honey press? Have you ever heard of someone pressing honey? So leave those down in the comment section below. It's always good to kind of gauge uh, people that are interested in this, what kind of information they're getting and where from and then how they're using it. So it's always cool that you guys share with us. Yeah. So. And you know, in the old days, this was common knowledge. Yeah. Uh, the book Keeping Bees in Horizontal Highs was originally written in 1892 and it talks about the presses and the, the better quality of honey that you obtained by pressing rather than expelling. It was all known to everyone a right. hundred years ago, but then got forgotten when people started valuing the low price of food or larger quantity of food production over the quality. Today everything is turning around and yeah. people want to have highest nutritional value in their yeah. food. So all of these old ideas are coming back. Not only that, but in one of the future videos, we'll talk to you about making mead. I'm not an alcohol drinker myself, but mead is an amazing drink which captures the diversity of flowers that the bees collected. So just for the sensual pr pleasure of tasting 20 different wildflowers in a gulp uh, uh, of, of, the mead, of, yeah. of the mead, uh, it's uh, wonderful to make a small batch yourself. So. Layens was explaining right. that pressed honey is much better for meat making because of the very high um, content of bee bread in it. Right. So if you add no additional yeast, then the natural yeast and bee bread will start the very slow and smooth fermentation. And also because these yeasts will be unique to different kinds of bee bread and different hives, the flavors of your meats will be different in oh, every yeah. batch. Right. So that'd be good. A lot of you have been asking about the mead. We cover, we've been covering a lot of this beekeeping stuff, but we have not touched on the mead. I'm not a big alcohol drinker myself either, so it's like not in our wheelhouse. But because you guys have been asking for it, we want to show you guys how to do it. So Yeah, so it's coming. Yes. And uh, then the technique that we use today for making two hives out of one is also in uh, Lane's book, Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives, and in Raising Honey Bee Queens. Again, the moment you split a hive in two like that, they were raising a queen. It's not something that's very complicated. This is the first step towards becoming self-sufficient right. in your beekeeping. You may not be willing or able to climb into trees to collect your swamp traps every year, and you don't have to. Once you have your local superior survivor stock that you collected from the wild, and the wild maybe wild colonies living even in a city in somebody's house, yeah. then you can start doing artificial swarms yourself and they never have to buy bees again, ever. And also you could use that technique also to make nukes, right? Could you yes. do that and then sell those as well? Nukes are very expensive, people buy them and then you're providing local, organic kind of taking care of natural bees uh, to your area as well. Exactly, instead of then buying packages from elsewhere, right. from another ecosystem right. where the bees not having adaptation to your winter, your local blooming pattern of plants, yep. you are saturating the local environment with the local adapted genetics of the bees. So if you start splitting hives like that to sell your surplus bees, mm -hmm. then you are rendering bees a great service too. Yeah. 
and your community. So yeah. again, make sure you guys are writing this information down. We have this whole playlist. All you guys have to do is hit that first one. It'll walk you through all this information. Every video we try to touch on different aspects of beekeeping and answer some of the questions you guys are dropping off in the comments section. And before we get out of here today too, I want to uh, put it, we're going to do a giveaway of a jar of the bee bread honey. This okay? one? Uh, a smaller one. Smaller one. Yeah, smaller one. <laughs> But I'm going to package you guys up. I'm going to give away two of them. I'll split a quart down half and I'll send out two. Wow. As long as the video gets 50,000 views in 24 hours and 5,000 <laughs> thumbs up. Right? Because this stuff is really valuable, this bee bread. And we want to send it out to you guys. So make sure you guys hit that go, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed before, and uh, follow along on some more bee adventures this year. Dr. Leo will be out kind of heavy this year with me because I got busted up ribs. I can't lift this stuff. I can barely manage the camera, uh, but we just want to keep bringing you this information throughout the year because we're doing it in the stages that you guys are going to be beekeeping at. So this is right now, this is, you can go out and do this pretty much depending on where you are in the country, but you can go out and do this right now. So uh, you can right now is the great time to set your swarm trap out and yep. catch your own swarm. Oh yeah. There are free plans on horizontalhive.com for building your own swarm trap or you can build uh, get one already built heavy duty and hanging on the tree and attract your local swarm of bees at no cost rather than uh, a box like that which will pay for itself with the first swarm you catch sure. and also i will be at the uh, Doug and Stacey's uh, oh, homesteading yeah. conference uh, the first weekend in August. Yep. Uh, also, I teach two-day beekeeping classes at my homestead in Missouri. If you'd like to come, the registration is now open for June 19th, 20th. This is the solstice weekend 2021. Um, if you are watching this video later, the updated schedule is on horizontalhive.com yep. where you can also find these books, get a lot of free plans and free information on natural beekeeping. And uh, if you'd like to press your own bee bread uh, honey, these Italian heavy duty stainless steel presses are available there too. This is the one I use myself for years and I highly recommend because uh, the kind of honey you produce, as the two lucky people will discover by right, getting a right. jar of honey from Doug, is not something you can buy anywhere for any money. Yeah, and all we did up to oil this up here was we just put some 30-30 uh, weight uh, motor oil right there on there. No, I'm just kidding. It was uh, uh, extra virgin olive oil. So it's some food grade oil up there and you're in business. That thing works really smooth. So a little uh, less to clean up as well, I might add, versus your big spinner. But everything has a purpose, right? Sometimes you're doing the bee bread and then sometimes you're doing the regular spinning. You know, all this stuff is investments and you could turn this into a great hobby or even an income for your homestead. So make sure you guys hit the thumbs up. Visit HorizontalHive.com, the link will be down below for all the free information, books, and all that stuff. And then check out his schedule, he'll be at the Homesteading Life Conference, and then hosting his own stuff. And then we're still going to try to work out the first workshop here at the property for you guys uh, for 2021 on beekeeping. And I think we're going to target that towards the fall, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I look forward to it. Yep. So we'll see you guys on the next video. See ya. Boom. <sighs> Have some 30.